Yeah, dear students, welcome to the visualization lecture, to the last lecture on information visualization. Um, I want to discuss scalability of information visualization techniques and visualization systems, some general thoughts on the design of visualization systems, and I want to give a number of examples. Um, these are systems that you can also try your own. They have public versions available. So like I created a number of visualizations for this lecture myself, you could also get some hands-on experience with these tools. Um, I want to start with scalability that yeah, has different aspects and, and components, one may say. Um, visualizations um, ideally are scalable with respect to the display size. That means they can be used at smaller displays um, with a lower amount of, of pixels, but also with a lower physical display size, for example, on the iPhone, um, but also on, on larger displays, maybe even ultra HD displays. So that is one scalability aspect. Human perception is, is another one. Yeah, Even if we can um, fabricate mean by very large displays, um, humans are not able to see all details of a very large display simultaneously. So just producing larger displays does not solve all the scalabilities that we may have. There are also some scalability issues related to performance, not only rendering performance, but also um, performance with respect to other algorithms which may be involved in creating um, visualizations. Yeah, I want to present some, some concepts of visualization systems, um, data flow based systems, and in the largest part, I want to introduce a number of um, tools. Um, yeah, I do this in a chronological order. So I start with the XMDV tool from Matt Ward, 1994. Um, so I would consider this as the first InfoVis tool that was available. Um, and later Polaris um, follows that has um, developed into the commercial Tableau system, which is very successful. Many Eyes is, is a web-based visualization system, probably the first web-based visualization um, system that gained widespread um, use. Um, it is a system that um, yeah, provides a number of techniques that are rather simple, also rather simple to use. So their major goal was to um, enable the development of visualization techniques for broad audiences. The D3 system you get to know in, in the exercises. Um, that is another web-based system with a lot of um, yeah, functionality involved, a powerful system um, that is really useful for, for many applications, I think. And Voyager um, is another more recent system that I also briefly want to introduce. Yeah, let me discuss this scalability um, problem a little bit more in detail. Visual representations are appropriate up to a certain limit only. Yeah, And there was one paper that discussed this in, in a lot of detail and with um, many examples that is from Stephen Eich and colleagues. I think it's from 2002. 2000 is probably not uh, correct. Um, and I will basically um, use this publication as a basis for, for what I present. The limit um, for the use of a visualization technique can be quantified um, as the number of elements to draw, for example, glyphs to draw in a scatter plot, we briefly discussed that overplotting can result um, in scatter plots, depending primarily on the number of elements um, that should be drawn, but of course also slightly depending on the specific distribution. Um, in a graph-based visualization, um, typically you want to, to label the nodes and sometimes even the edges. Yeah, So the number of elements to label may limit um, how many objects can be shown there. We have seen table-based visualizations, so there the number of rows and, and columns um, are somehow limited. Um, the edges and nodes in graph-based visualizations, so that, that is a problem um, again with respect to, to graphs, even if they are not labeled, um, there is only a certain number that you can perceive and that you can displays. If you have dynamic data, often the number of points in time is, is a limit. 
So the limit can be due to the screen resolution. Yeah. So at some point you, you simply have no more pixels available to, to draw and, and display something, um, but also due to performance and the human ability to interpret the data. In the long run, it is quite clear that this is um, the most restricting aspect of these. Yeah? Um, we get better and better in, in solving performance problems with even better hardware and, and more powerful algorithms. We can build larger and larger displays, but the abilities of our brain are still quite similar to the abilities of the brain of, of, the brain of, of persons um, in the Middle Ages. One aspect that um, may be discussed here as well is interaction. Yeah? Um, the scalability limits of a visualization techniques are different um, when certain interactions are available. Yeah? Um, we can increase the, the number of data to be displayed as a rule of thumb by one order of magnitude based on interaction. Yeah, without changing the visualization technique itself. One order of magnitude, that's quite considerable. Um, but of course, uh, there are situations where this would not be sufficient. Yeah? So imagine that with, with panning and, and zooming, um, you want to understand something in very large data. And the, the portion that you currently see um, enlarged to the whole display space is less than 1% of the overall size of the data, then you probably get lost even with zooming and panning. Yeah? Um, so that, that helps, but that has limits of its own. Yeah, to discuss this display scalability, let's look at um, typical display resolutions that we have currently, yeah, starting from the iPhone to HD displays to Ultra um, HD displays with yeah, more than 8 million pixels. That is a typical range today, I would say. Yeah, there are display walls that are even larger, um, but, but that is a typical range. Yeah, so and let's um, think about HD displays, HD displays. Bar charts, we can show up to 100 bars, I would say. Stacked bar charts, if we have um, 10 different colors, yeah, for 10 different things we want to show, um, and um, this applies to, to 50 data sets, yeah, leading to 50 bars, that, that is probably a limit. 50 times 10 is 500, yeah, we have horizontally almost 2000 uh, pixels, so then every bar can be 2 to 3 pixels wide. We, we also want to have gaps between the bars, of course, yeah, so that is really a limit there. If we have matrix views, assuming a cell size of 10 times 10, yeah, we can show up to 190 times 100 cells. Yeah. And for scatter plots, I would say the limit is around 200,000 points. In principle, um, if our dots are very small, yeah, we have 2 million pixels, it, it could be a bit more, but probably um, the, the individual dots should not be only one pixel, but probably a region of two times two pixels. And of course, um, it is very unlikely that the data is completely equally spread over the whole display space. It is typically um, correlated and concentrated in certain areas. So 200,000 points could be already too much. Yeah. Just some examples of this uh, publication from, from Ike and Carl. Um, stacked bar charts. Yeah. Um, so here you see how this could be arranged. In, in this example, these are 15 bars and you see that this is a quite small display. It, it could be more than 15, yeah? um, but it could not be more than, than 150. Here is a network view with 13 nodes. That's not too much, but they are basically, all of them are connected with each other, leading to 100 edges. This is already quite a lot. So to, to ask the question whether there is a connection between uh, one node and another node, that, that could be difficult. Yeah? If I look quite carefully, indeed here is a line, um, the line with smaller than for the other lines. So it is only partially vis visible, hard to follow. Yeah? So without interaction, that is almost the limit. Yeah? Um, so that, 
that cannot be too much. To um, discuss what happens if you try to push the limits, um, the scalability limits, look at this display of, of bar charts. Yeah? Um, here we get successively more bars added. Yeah? And at some point um, that seems to translate to a continuous visualization. Yeah? Here it is clearly a discrete visualization. We have distinctive points in time and something is displayed for these points in time. Um, but, but here um, it starts to become continuous and here I would say it is indeed continuous and you have basically no chance to understand individual points in time here, which may be interesting because as you see, um, there are obviously strong differences locally. Um, so there, there may be outliers of other situations that, that lead to a special um, number for one point in time, but that is, is no longer recognizable if you have so many bars. Here's a table-based view. Um, here you can read the ele elements of the table. Here the transformation to a table-based visualization where these quantitative values are mapped to the length of these bars. Yeah? And up to a certain number of, of rows and columns, this works quite well. Yeah? If we would use the whole display space, could be even a bit more, but it could not be 10 times as many rows. Yeah? Then um, the individual rows start to be no longer recognizable. Yeah, which interaction facilities may help to increase cognitive limits? Magnification lenses, of course, to enable a local zoom. Um, so I think the, the estimation of Ike is, is correct. That helps up to a factor of, of five. Yeah? Um, if it would be necessary to zoom even more, then it could be a good idea to think about aggregating the data. Yeah? There are situations in which indeed even stronger zooming is necessary. Yeah? So for example, in, in, in medicine, in histology, um, pathologists look at microscopy data. Yeah? And these data have a really high spatial resolution. So they um, magnify often up to a factor of, of 60. Yeah? But then it gets really difficult to understand where I have been already, what I have seen in detail. Um, computer support may help that directs the attention of the physician to certain regions. Here you really should um, zoom into um, with a high magnifying factor of 40 or, or 60 um, so, so that you get additional support. Just um, to provide magnification lenses then is not um, sufficient. If as a consequence of uh, interaction facilities your visualization changes strongly. Yeah? You have discrete changes between different representations, for example. Um, it is ideally if these changes are animated, yeah? so that seamless transitions are generated and the user can observe what happens, yeah? see a certain movement. Yeah? If you change, for example, um, the, the region that, that is displayed by, by, by panning, yeah? um, it, it could be good if this is really shown in, in an animation. That is better to interpret than if you have two states, one is completely different from the other one and you have to find out what could it be that happened in the meantime. Yeah? So again, based on, on Ike's work, panning and zooming is restricted um, to display areas up to five times larger than the physical screen space. That is what what uh, he recommends and I'm not quite sure whether this applies to both horizontal and, and vertical um, space. So then in total the, the overall space would be 25 times larger. That could be the, the maximum of what you can navigate quite easily. Yeah? Emphasis techniques may also help if, the, if certain things that are probably important for the user based on the task analysis that was carried out are emphasized. Um, you remember our discussion on perception. Emphasize means to show elements of the data in such a way that they are perceived without effort, pre-attentively, they pop out. Yeah? Um, so that, of course, makes, makes it easier to 
see not only these elements, but also to understand their configuration and the overall layout. Multiple coordinated views often also help to improve the scalability. Um, of course, with multiple coordinated views, you now have different views that uh, compete with each other for the limited display space that could be seen as a, as a disadvantage. But if this is carefully done with an, an overview visualization, for example, that is rather large, and then secondary visualizations that consume lower screen space but show some individual aspects, yeah, that could be helpful. So Ike, for example, recommends the overview could be a scatter plot. Yeah? And if you think back to our discussion of scatter plots, a scatter plot can not only be used to show the correlation between two data, one dependent and one independent variable, um, but the color of the um, elements of a scatter plot could also reveal information. That is what we described as multi-class scatter plot. Um, and also the glyph size may be um, used in order to indicate another variable. So in total, you could use four variables. We have seen even more examples where the glyph shape was also um, adapted. Yeah, that would give you a fifth variable. But then that starts to be become a little bit more difficult to interpret. And definitely you should not use too many different glyph shapes. Yeah, in addition to such an overview, um, histograms, bar charts, and pie charts are often secondary views or supporting views, as, as Ike has called them, um, used for brushing and filter the information that is displayed in the central views. Yeah? So these um, supporting views are also interactive and, and can be used to decide what actually should be shown in the overview. Yeah? So here's an example of um, this publication where bar charts, for example, are used as secondary views. The central view here is a 3D visualization, not, not a scatter plot, but what he called an information landscape with cylindrical glyphs. Yeah, I would say this um, yeah, was in the time when 3D visualizations of abstract data were more popular than they actually are today. And it's not only a matter of, of popularity. It, meanwhile, it is quite clear that um, the occlusions um, that are inherent to 3D visualizations and the interaction that is necessary to see everything that may be occluded um, is, is a disadvantage that you would avoid. Yeah. So, But the idea of a central view as an overview, that is definitely valid. And Ike himself also suggested not only these landscapes, but also scatter plots. Um, and that is certainly a good strategy. Yeah, some remarks also with respect to performance. Yeah, um, If we have visualizations that involve complex glyphs, then we need to be careful that this does not restrict um, the rendering performance of our system. Um, with rendering performance, I mean in particular that in case of interactions, the system is really able to respond in a, in a fast manner. Yeah. Um, it is essential if you analyze and explore data um, that you are in a flow of doing something, evaluating the visualizations and what you see, starting new interactions and, and continue with the explorative process. Um, whenever you have to wait for something, when noticeable delays arise, that really slows you down. It slows you down not only for the rather short amount of time um, where you really have to wait, um, but, but your concentration um, is no longer fully on this activity. Uh, you get distracted and, and this causes a mental overload which actually slows you down more than the system is slowed down. Yeah. One remark to, to 3D visualizations, um, they are effective or could be effective um, when natural shapes are shown where we really have, um, where we are familiar with um, and can interpret their spatial relations very well. Yeah? Something um, like a scatter plot in 3D where, where we basically see a point cloud in 3D is not very effective because seeing things like shadow and shading and all the things we use in reality to interpret 3D basically makes no sense for such shapes. Yeah? 
um, and of course um, occlusion problems occur. Um, so 3D visualizations should only be used if the information is, is not that large and, and occlusion problems are not so severe. Typically for abstract data, 3D visualizations are not used. Rendering performance in general um, has lost a bit of its importance in the last 22 to 30 years due to a lot of progress in computing hardware and in particular in, in rendering hardware and GPUs. Um, but the performance uh, per perception related scalability problems, of course, remains. And um, whereas rendering performance is no longer an issue, other um, system performance issues could be a problem. Um, for example, some techniques in order to generate very good graph layouts um, can take a long time. Yeah? We discussed that, that some algorithms are even NP-complete. Um, so they are basically not applicable for larger graphs. What a visualization system could do here um, is to select an algorithm or parameters of an algorithm, termination criteria, for example, automatically based on some properties of the data. And the most important property of the data is their size. Yeah? Um, so the, the whole scalability discussion may have the consequence that you think about what are different situations where your system is expected to work um, and to provide some adaptive behavior with respect to different display sizes um, and with respect to computing hardware that is more or less powerful. Um, and of course, it also involves that you have to try your system in these different environments um, to see whether the adaptive functions that you provided um, and intended really work as you supposed they are working. Yeah, let me describe some concepts of visualization systems. Visualization systems have an underlying data model that is quite important. We touched this um, topic um, already in one of the earlier lectures when we discussed grid types and, and data formats and so on. Yeah. Um, so here for, for abstract data, a grid type, for example, is, is not so important. Typically, we have data organized in, in graph structures. Um, yeah, so we, we have nodes and they have links um, to other nodes representing edges. Or we have relational databases. These are quite typical data models. Some systems provide efficient databases. For example, Advisor. Um, that is a professional system for business intelligence, actually a system that was um, created largely by Stephen Icke and colleagues. So many of the thoughts that I presented so far are, are part of, of Advisor. And, and their system has in-memory databases. So they are quite, quite efficient. The access to the data and the way how the data can be analyzed and visualized strongly depends on this underlying data model. In general, one may say that most visualization systems support databases. Yeah? So their data is organized in, in tables with columns and, and rows and visual specifications, for example, with range sliders or checkboxes and um, other interactive controls are mapped to database queries. Yeah? Um, when I think of database queries, I think primarily of, of SQL queries. Yeah? select operations, for example. And you can also integrate data from multiple sources. Yeah, So this is um, then mapped to a join operation in SQL to, to actually access the database. Yeah, let's think of some essential tasks for data analysis and visualization. We thought already about essential tasks and goals in visualization. Um, not specific to information visualization, a little bit more general, but all that was discussed there is applicable here as well. I want to recap what I think was the major point of the discussion. There are different stages in the visualization process depending on how familiar we are with the data, starting with the exploration of the data. Data is new and we want to get familiar with it. Um, we then want to describe the data yeah, using some a descriptive statistics, for example, um, 
later we, we want to explain the data and communicate the data. Yeah? So and um, these are the different stages that are relevant here as well. Yeah? We have to start typically with data preparation. Data often needs to be normalized, integrated from different sources. Other um, tasks can be important here. Data quality is, is often not perfect. It has to be checked and perhaps some measures have to be taken in order to, to improve data quality, to gather new data. So that is often a quite extensive step. Then it, it is often a good next step until when we are satisfied with our data, they are prepared quite well, uh, we can analyze distributions of attributes of the individual variables. We can compare distributions of different attributes. So imagine in a, in a business case, we have uh, sales data in different European countries for all month of the year, over several years, for example, and we can compare the development in different European countries. Yeah? Comparing something is often um, the, the basis for discovering correlations um, and also for grouping information. Yeah? So perhaps certain countries have a quite similar development um, and others um, differ strongly. Outliers are often quite important. So we may deliberately search for outliers and abnormalities. Um, there are specific methods um, that detect outliers. So not only that you visually can see them, um, but you can also um, yeah, automatically compute them. Some of these methods produce a binary result. Yeah, a data set is either an outlier or not. Others um, yeah, generate a continuous value between 0 and 1, an outlierness score. So something is more or less um, probably an outlier. Yeah? More on this um, will be discussed in the visual analytics um, lecture and the videos to this lecture are already available on our YouTube channel. Yeah, and aggregate information is often um, derived, average, mean, um, median, min, max, interquartile ranges. Um, and yeah, that um, is another source of information that is often quite useful. Yeah? Median and interquartile ranges requires sorting, so that takes a bit more time to compute. Some strategies for the visualization systems. There are toolkits that provide many techniques and many parameters. Yeah? Um, that is often a good idea because that yeah, provides enough flexibility to use a visualization system for many different tasks. Yeah? But if the only strategy of designing a visualization system is to support as many techniques and parameters as possible, uh, then the task for the developer of a visualization solution may be very difficult. Typically, um, these developers need support in the creation of analytic workflows yeah, that provide some guidance how the later end user of the visualization system uh, can employ the system. And these workflows ideally are reused, maybe they are adapted in reusing them, um, but that should be somehow um, supported. Yeah? Um, in previous years, um, the, the visualization students learned to use Mavis Lab, that is a large library with a focus on, on medical image processing and visualization, but providing a lot of visualization techniques that are more general uh, than this. Yeah, and there you, you can visually specify a network and can, can reuse it, apply it to very different data sets. That is a quite useful strategy um, to support workflow generation. More and more visualization system integrate something that may be even labeled as artificial intelligence techniques. Um, namely, they suggest visualization techniques and parameters based on properties of the data and sometimes also based on the on the task. Yeah? So we will uh, later look at one of the visualization systems tableau um, that has an option where you press the show me button after you loaded and prepared your data. And um, the show me button 
leads you to a selection of some techniques that are particularly suitable for this specific data set. Yeah? Easing the task of creating visualizations to a strong extent. And that is definitely, definitely useful in order to increase uh, the number of people that can successfully use visualization systems um, to create interactive visualizations for their users. Um, one example for broadening um, the target audience for visualization systems are journalists. Yeah? More and more you see in, in journals and in the online versions of journals quite smart visualizations, even interactive visualizations that allow you as the reader of the journal uh, to explore the data. Um, so this is a group of users that definitely benefits from this. Yeah? So maybe it should not be done fully automatically. Maybe it is a good idea that instead of creating just one visualization automatically, um, a small set of possible options is, is presented from which you can choose. Yeah? That makes you think a little bit more about the visualization if there are, are alternatives from which you can choose and which you can compare. It could be also realized in such a way that um, systems in principle let the, the analyst or the, the author of a visualization working independently, um, but there is a certain function um, where the developer may say, I'm, I'm interested in suggestions. Yeah, please make suggestions. Um, so that is a bit different because then the initiative is from the developer. Data analysis and visualization often go hand in hand. And I would say in, in an increasing number of cases, simply visualizing the data with some 2D and 3D visualization techniques is not enough in order to understand the data. You need also data analysis techniques. And that gives rise to the following principal questions when designing visualization systems. Yeah, you could argue for creating separate systems. Yeah, there is one system that provides advanced data analysis um, with clustering, classification, decision trees, random forests, data mining techniques. Um, and that provides a lot of these techniques with powerful algorithms. Um, maybe there's even a selection of algorithms for each category of these data mining tasks and the system is smart enough to, to choose from them. Um, and there is another separate system that provides statistical information yeah, um, with all the advanced multi-parametric uh, statistics. Um, and finally, there is a visualization system that provides various information visualization techniques, interaction techniques, coordinated views. They are all separate. Yeah? The advantage is the separate systems are focused um, may be adapted to, to new research quite, quite easily, um, that would be a major advantage. The disadvantage is, of course, um, if the systems are separated, the, the analytical process of, of an author who wants to understand the data is not very fluent. Um, the individual systems cannot be so tightly coupled if these are individual systems. Yeah? Typically, you use one system, um, perform a lot of tasks with the system, generate some results, store them, export them, and then start the next system um, and import the data. Hopefully, nothing is lost and you can really fully import all the data. Um, but of course, um, it would be difficult to go forth and back several times. Yeah? So with separate systems, Often workflows are realized in, in such a way, first you do statistics or data mining, then you are ready with this, you produce a lot of results, for example, a clustering of your data. Then this is loaded in the visualization system and you use only the visualization system. Yeah? You do not go back to the uh, data mining uh, stage and ask for, for new analytical results. That was called visual data mining, by the way. So their data mining was more or less a pre-process to interactive visualization. Yeah? If you integrate data analysis and visualization, 
that allows a tighter coupling um, where data mining is really part of the interactive reasoning process and not just a pre-process. Yeah, so therefore a tighter coupling is, is actually desirable. So I want to make you aware of a simple integrated system that actually is not so simple. It, it provides a lot of functions. It is well thought. Um, it is used for, for many, many applications um, and was refined, of course, appropriately. Yeah? So in, in practice, um, many problems can already be solved with Excel. Yeah? Data is relate, um, represented here in tables. It can be filtered, of course. Yeah? So you can specify Boolean expressions. You can sort the tables according to selected columns. Yeah, that's, that's quite flexible. And you can statistically analyze the data. Um, there are approximately 30 pre-built formula. Um, and these are primarily focused on finance applications. Yeah? With a plug-in mechanism, you can support um, other things as well. Um, you can also, without a plug-in, just specify an individual function. So, for example, if you want to have a new column with derived data where the new value is five times the value of the first column and three times the value of the second column, yeah, you may add this. And when you do this um, and, and you add more data, yeah, because more data arrives, then also these um, derived uh, data um, change as well. Yeah? So that's not too bad. And for the visualization, there are diagrams, a quite wide range of diagrams with flexible options for legends and, and scaling um, and, and how the axes are, are labeled, for example. Yeah, that is all available. So just uh, one screenshot to, to emphasize this a little bit. Yeah, here you see many diagram types, um, bar charts, uh, line diagrams, pie charts, um, scatter plot like representations. Um, and, and you also see here is a slider. So these are not even all of the basic types. And for each of them, you have many customization options. Yeah? So that's, that's not too bad. Major interaction techniques in Excel and also in, in other visualization techniques are filtering. That's really important that you can determine subsets of the rows and columns in which you are particularly interested in. Um, for quantitative data, it is recommended to use range sliders yeah, where you can visually specify um, an, an interval. And for ordinal or nominal data, list boxes or check boxes can be used. Sorting and, and grouping is um, supported and, and should be supported. Um, undo and redo may help to yeah, support, I would say, a trial and error process. Um, and it, in particular, the exploration stage of um, becoming familiar with data benefits a lot from a trial and error approach um, and thus from undo and redo. Details on demand is, is often a useful function, so you can select entries and get further information for the selected entries. Yeah? Um, Tooltips are used for individual objects, and if you are interested in groups of objects, um, then brushing is applied. Yeah? We discussed this rectangular brush, for example, um, defines intervals in, in two dimensions, and the selected objects which have values in this range are emphasized in, in other visualizations or texture information is provided in a different view for them. And it's essential to be able to export screenshots or the, the history of, of all the analytical steps that you have performed that is essential for report generation. And report generation yeah, is at the final stage of, of visualization typically namely when you present and communicate your results. After you have understood them and are able to describe and explain them, you finally want to communicate them. I want to mention and, and briefly discuss this term provenance. Yeah? Um, if visualizations are generated and, and should be used as decision support, 
yeah, imagine now with the COVID-19 situation, um, politicians have to make a number of decisions. They need to, to understand data um, and um, they, they get an understanding of the data based on visualizations. Yeah? And it should be really clear how these visualizations have been generated. What was done in order to come up with these visualizations? Was there some outlier removal process integrated? Was there some kind of, of smoothing the data? If the data was somehow categorized, yeah, um, what exactly um, was uh, the strategy for, for uh, categorizing the data? Yeah? So all this is summarized as, as provenance. The provenance of the um, visualizations should be provided. Yeah? That may include version control. That means it should be clear who created the data who later modified the data, yeah, that, that also has to do with, with responsibility. I have seen one very large research project, um, neuroscience research projects, um, where yeah, younger researchers annotate the large raw data um, and make first analysis, and that is specified in the system who did this. Um, then there are more senior scientists that look at these annotations and, and verify them and electronically sign and confirm that they have um, confirmed these annotations. Um, and then there is a third level, the project leaders, um, that, that make a last check, a double check, um, so that it is really clear that the annotations that lead to groupings of the data, for example, um, is, is really reliable. Yeah? Visualization is, is not something that has not been taken seriously, yeah, just nice and pretty images, but often visualizations are quite important um, and therefore version control aspects and provenance aspects should be taken seriously. Yeah, then let me come to the individual tools. I want to start with the XMDV system, a strange name um, that, that you cannot speak, but the system is really um, a pioneering work that is important, an early free tool for the visualization of multidimensional data. The techniques could be um, parameterized um, as well. Yeah, it was not so flexible as, as later tools, of course, yeah, but it was really a first one. It provided parallel coordinates, star glyphs, yeah, um, where you can specify a minimum and maximum length of the individual um, axis. Scatter plot matrices were provided, and brushing and linking. Yeah, um, we discussed things like like smooth brushing, for example, or more advanced brushing shapes. That was not um, involved and included in this first system. Yeah, here are just some screenshots. Um, all apply to the crime data set, so certain types of crime occur more or less often, and that is indicated here with star glyphs and parallel coordinates and a scatter plot matrix. Yeah? So this is the XMDV tool. Later there was Polaris, and that developed into Tableau from Chris Stolte and others. Um, core features are that you could explore databases with visual queries, such as range sliders. Um, there is a set of selected fields that you can use and marks. Marks are yeah, visual symbols that are used um, to show the data. Statistical analysis is integrated here as well. Um, and here also brushing is quite flexible. Just one screenshot of this early version of Polaris from Chris Stolte. So you see here um, the, the profit and the sales for coffee, espresso, herbal tea and, and other tea um, that is uh, shown for different regions, west, south, east and, and central. Yeah? Um, you can specify these, these marks that are used here. In this example, these are glyphs and these are the four individual glyphs um, that are used. Tooltips, of course, are available. So something is in the West and, and what exactly is meant with West is shown here. It is 
California. Um, yeah, this is also part of the of the legend. Yeah, so that that explains basically um, which glyph shapes are used here. Data is somehow aggregated. Yeah, so grouping is is supported here. Yeah, that um, yeah is a system that already supports quite powerful analysis of abstract data as we have them typically in information visualization. Here is a later version, um, Tableau, yeah, that is the commercial system that is around right now. Um, and yeah, I played a little bit with this system and imported the metal data set. Yeah? The metal data set um, is a data set that relates to the Olympic Games. And there it is collected for every country how many gold medals, silver and bronze medals um, sportsmen of that country won for each of the different Olympic Games. Yeah? And that can be shown here. Yeah? So here you see that the sum of total medals is used for this visualization. Um, this could be very low starting from one um, and there is one country that has the maximum value with more than 1,000 of these Olympic medals. Um, and this is classified by region and country. Yeah? So the label here always relates to the, to the um, region, that is the continent. Um, so these are all the European countries. Um, these are the two North American countries, the US and, and um, Canada. Um, and yeah, correspondingly countries in, in Latin America and Africa and so on. Yeah? So that is a first visualization. Yeah, here are other visualizations that you can generate for the same data. Um, a bubble chart yeah, with these circular grooves that, that show that most medalists come from Europe. A word cloud um, is also possible. And yeah, you could of course look a little bit more in, in detail. Yeah? Um, so here um, the data is shown along with the observation space, as I called it in the last video lecture. Um, that means with the map display, um, the borders are very weakly recognizable. Yeah? But here is North America, um, Latin America, South America with, with Argentina and so on. Here is Africa, here is Europe and here is, is Asia. And the circle size um, in, um, incorporates the number of medals, the total numbers. Yeah? It's not separated into um, gold, silver and bronze medalists. I mentioned already that there is a show me button. Yeah? Um, that is indeed what you can use to get an initial visualization. Yeah? You import the data and then just press the show me buttons. Some further visualizations of the same data that, that give yeah, maybe a bit more insight. Um, so here another map display and here an area chart that shows the development over time. Yeah? Olympic Games take place every fourth year if there is no COVID-19. Um, but um, yeah, since approximately 20 years, the Winter Games are in different years than the Summer Games. So we have Olympic Games in 2000, 2002, 2004, 2006 and so on. Um, and this is not the number of medals won in a particular Olympic Games, but it is cumulative. Yeah? Uh, the numbers are always increasing. Um, and it shows the development for the different continents. Yeah? So Europe um, was already 20 years before the country with most medals and, and yeah, that has, um, has not changed basically in the, in the years to come. Um, and North America is, is also quite strong. Africa a little bit increasing. Yeah, second example from Tableau. This is data related to the use of cellular phones. Yeah? So here I used indeed the show me button. Um, and the system provides me not only with one suggestion, but, but with a number of them. Yeah? For example, a geographic map, um, but also with visualizations that do not show the map data. Yeah? So one option is, um, for example, um, a line chart that just 
shows how after yeah after um, a very slow development from a certain point on in the late 1990s cellular phone use increased considerably very strongly yeah here the same information is, is shown in a in a bar chart yeah and with tooltips of course you get the detailed information about the year of 2002 for example where there have been five million cell phones in use worldwide yeah for categorical data you need check boxes in order to specify which of them you want to see so which of the regions should be shown here on the map display yeah here you have further customization functions in order to um, define this map based visualization polaris and tableau meanwhile uh, support high resolution displays yeah so they are flexible to support different display sizes you may generate stories yeah with summarizing maps diagrams and annotations yeah um, there is a commercial version that is very powerful um, but even the tableau public system that is the freely publicly available system um, yeah allows you to get some understanding of, of many visualization techniques and also some basic data sets are provided like the cellular phone data set and the metadata set that I have used for creating the examples I just showed to you. I also want to mention um, the Many Eyes system. Yeah? Many Eyes is a quite creative system. The developers of, of Many Eyes um, are at least partially designers, yeah? so not core computer science experts. And their major goal was to create a system that makes it possible to upload and share data sets, create new visualizations and, and distribute them. The system was developed, um, yeah, I have seen the first demo in 2007, um, so it, it was quite popular approximately around 2010. Yeah? But major ideas are still valid, so therefore um, I, I want to, to show this. The visualizations may be tagged and commented and related to each other. So the user um, could, could say these visualizations are related for me. I want to, to group them. Um, that was all realized with JavaScript, yeah, which is a reasonable technology for a web-based system. And the major developers from IBM are Fernanda Viegas, Jesse Chris, Martin Wattenberg, Frank van Ham, Matt McCune and Irene Ross some publications um, also in the list of references at the end and I linked a video to this as well. Yeah, major visualization techniques include bar charts, pie charts, map displays, tree maps, bubble charts, theme rivers, that's a special kind of uh, stacked bar representation, box plots, star graphs and word clouds. Word clouds were quite popular at that time and I think they are no longer so popular today and that is probably due to the fact that yeah it is not so effective to to understand a lot of information based on word clouds typical interaction facilities were also available of course um, visualizations um, were assigned with a title with a description with keywords and with comments yeah so that is something i really like that they thought about this meta information I would call it um, to make it possible to yeah, have a good overview over a large collection of visualizations yeah so basically all these informations serve in order to to search for visualizations that specify that fulfill a certain um, specification yeah, and the visualizations may be uploaded to Facebook, Twitter, um, they may be emailed. That all is, is uh, somehow clear today that the visualization system should provide this, but it was not at all clear at that time. Yeah? And yeah, that is also a system that you may use and create visualizations yourself. Yeah, let's look at some examples. Um, I make a short remark here on timeline based visualizations um, which are also part of um, the many eyes system 
Um, here we see again a 3D visualization as it was popular for, for some time. Um, also as an overview for many time courses, but that actually is not very effective. Here is um, a timeline based visualization that is much more um, effective um, from the same publication from Jacques van Wyk. Um, this is the number of, of employees working at a certain point of time. At nine o'clock, um, yeah, a large number of people arrived. At 10 o'clock, even more are there. Um, after 12 o'clock, it starts to decrease um, a little bit. And after five o'clock, um, even more people left work. Yeah, and um, the data was available for every day of the year. Um, and it was clustered. So what you see here are cluster representatives. Yeah, you do not see 365 lines, but, but only six. Yeah, it is a kind of a calendar based visualization. Yeah, and we all are familiar with calendars. Um, so therefore, this is a good idea. The clustering um, is conveyed with colors. The different colors that you see here uh, in the calendar view correspond to the colors that you see here. Yeah, so of course, the weekends that is a, a special um, color. Yeah, that is probably this one where, where basically no one is at work. Yeah, word clouds um, as an example for what you can do with, with many eyes. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what kind of occurrences is meant here. I think these are car accident data. Um, we talked about sunspot activities in one of the earlier lectures. Maybe you remember there is a periodicity. So every 11th year sunspot activities is, is strongly increased. Yeah. Um, and this sunspot activity data um, is shown here for um, the years from 1990 to 2013 um, with a tree map display. Yeah? So every year basically uh, leads to, to one component here of the tree map. Here that was uh, done on a, on a monthly basis and here on a on a daily basis. Yeah? So then, of course, you have a deeper hierarchy. You have years and month um, and the individual days of the month. Yeah? So these are the three category levels. Yeah? And a color scale um, where the, the brightness of the color indicates um, the quantitative data. Yeah? That's a useful color scale here. Maybe what one could criticize is that people are not so sensitive to differences in bluish colors. Yeah, so that was my fault. I certainly had um, an option to, to choose another um, color scale, um, a color scale that uses more reddish or, or yellowish color um, might be more appropriate. Map displays could be used. Um, and um, yeah, we have seen an example of a graduated symbol map in the in the last video lecture. So here is another example of this. I think it was car accident data. Here it was internet and Facebook use per continent. Um, and the, the box plot here uh, relates to the countries in that continent. Yeah, so that leads to a certain interquartile range, which is shown here quite well. Yeah, Africa, of course, has had the lowest um, use and the Middle East is, is here and, and Europe is, is here where in all countries um, Internet and Facebook use was quite extensive. Yeah, these were a few remarks related to many eyes. Then let me make a few comments on D3, the system that you use in the exercises, a modern web-based environment. It is also based on JavaScript, like many eyes. Um, and yeah, it's very frequently used. It employs a number of standards um, that are part of modern web browsers like um, SVG, HTML5, and, and CSS. Um, it is very flexible. Yeah, it really provides um, a lot of um, techniques and combination options, tooltips, and all the other interaction facilities. I want to make one remark on the major developer that is Mike Boskop. Uh, Mike Bostock, he worked for the New York Times until 2015 for, for several years um, and he used D3 for many data with 
projects. That means um, if you looked at the online version of the New York Times, there were many interactive visualizations created by Mike Bostock using his own system, D3. We have a lot of experience in our group as well. So our visual analytics projects often related to large medical data, health data, um, employ D3. There are two reasons for this. On the one hand, it provides really a good selection of, of techniques that we can choose from. And also for us, it is quite important that the system is web-based. We have cooperation partners that are far away um, in, in other parts of Germany. Um, and it makes a lot of sense that we uh, can provide our developments to them in such a way that they can directly use them within the web browser without the need to install any plugin or to install any other software, which is never easy in a, in a hospital setting. Yeah, they just can use the web browser. So that enabled an intense cooperation that would not be possible with other um, visualization systems. Yeah, here's a collection of the visualization techniques that, that are provided. You remember these are Voronoi diagrams as a decomposition of the space. There are force directed layouts for graphs. There are all kinds of radial displays as well. There is edge bundling. So basically the state of the art um, for all these individual techniques is, is carefully um, considered here. Yeah, that is really an up-to-date visualization system. Um, there is also a recommender system that yeah, is a little bit similar to the show me button in, in Tableau. Um, so for example, if you select a variable, um, this suggests to you visualizations that emphasize correlating variables. You can also bookmark um, visualizations Uh, that is already Voyager, so I was a bit too fast. Voyager is, is another uh, visualization system, also a web-based system, the last one that I briefly wanted to mention. Yeah. So with, without going into a lot of detail, that is also something where I recommend to have a short look at yeah, um, to get a good understanding of one visualization system benefits um, when you also have at least a little understanding of other systems so that you can can compare a little bit. Yeah, so I want to summarize this video lecture. Um, in the beginning, I discussed scalability as an essential criterion for information visualization techniques. Um, I described a number of visualization systems that support the selection of visualization techniques based on properties of the data. I started by discussing that an integration of analytical components and interactive visualization is useful. Um, we have seen that some visualization systems provide um, yeah, support for generating whole workflows. Um, and yeah, therefore, that is a quite high level support um, useful to, to reach broader audiences for visualization. In this uh, summary slide here, I have um, included a link with the creators of the many eye systems. I think that is quite, quite interesting. Um, and I also included a link to a collection of InfoBiz techniques. A little bit of an outlook. Yeah? Information visualization, as I have presented it in the last uh, series of video lectures, is based on guidelines. And these guidelines are rooted in perception, and graphics design and aesthetics, yeah? um, for example, relating to the use of diagram types, axis and color. As an example, we have discussed that pie charts are not particularly effective in conveying a quantitative um, information, bar charts are more effective. Yeah? And this is probably a, a guideline that has enough evidence from, from experiments that, that you can really rely on this. Yeah? But not all the guidelines uh, that, that you can read, probably also not all the recommendations that I have given are really based on, on a lot of experiments, on replicated experiments. Perhaps you just have the experience, uh, experiments carried out by the authors um, of the technique. 
Yeah? So the, the scientific um, justification is, is not for all of these recommendations very good. Yeah? That is um, just a matter of fact since this discipline is still quite new and quite recent. Yeah? So there is a need for further research and studied about how to choose information visualization techniques, how to combine them, how to choose parameters. Yeah? I mentioned one uh, publication from Robert Kosara um, with the provocative title An Empire Built on Scent. Yeah? So he um, basically says that um, the arguments for many recommendations are not so great. Um, this is already a couple of years before, so things certainly have improved in the meantime. Um, but there is still need for further research and developments. And to just make this a little bit more specific, visualizations should not only convey data in, in a convincing manner, um, in, in an effective manner, ideally they should also be memorable. Yeah? It would be good if I really can remember what I have seen um, in a journal with, with respect to a certain interactive visualization. Yeah, what actually makes visualizations memorable? It is not that there is no research at all in this direction, but this is definitely something um, where more research is, is needed. Yeah? Also, the use of, of animations is not studied very well. Yeah? One may say as a general statement that animated transitions can be observed and reduce the cognitive load compared to two completely different visualizations. Um, but, yeah, that of course is not sufficient um, for guiding the developer of a visualization system how exactly to use animations, when to use it, and when to avoid it because other um, strategies to show the data are more convincing. Yeah, at the end, um, a list of references. I want to emphasize this one here Mike Bostock, Vadim Ogiewiecki, and Jeffrey Hares. Um, paper on the D3 system. Yeah, it has more than 3,000 citations. So that tells you that this is really something that has a lot of impact. I employed um, this paper from Stephen Eich and Ellen Kerr on visual scalability quite a lot. Um, and I also recommend Chris Stolte's um, work on the Polaris system. And yeah, also the many eyes systems I discussed many eyes aside for visualization at internet scale um, presented in 2007. Yeah, with this I'm at the end and I want to thank you for your attention.